Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to listen in in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in our music world. Today, I have the extraordinary pleasure of having Eric Boudreau, longtime friend, and finally, finally, we were able to, to get this together. He's, he's in Mexico right now. So that's why, that's why we have that beautiful background, and I love it. So, Eric, thank you so much. I think the, the, the invitation it was, a pretty, uh, was a cool opportunity uh, for chatting. And, uh, yeah, I watched a few of your shows uh, in the past, uh, the past year when you started your project, and I think, uh, yeah, you do well. You do a very good job. Thank you. We have, well, we've had some really, really nice conversations with uh, you know, a lot of people. I mean, we've had so many already. And it's just nice to have that conversation about shaping your journey and, you know, the thought process. I mean, we know what yep. people have done. You know, we know what Billy Cobham did. We know what uh, Bill Bruford and Steve Gadd. But it, it's really that process. What were you thinking? Who were the people that helped you? What was, what was behind that propelled you in your journey, in your whole trajectory that made it where you are? Because we're always going to be on our journey till the end, wherever that end is. <laughs> so before, yep. before we talk about what, what you've done, and you certainly have done a lot of things and a lot of music and a lot of projects, before that, let's go back to the very beginning. Tell us what was the beginning? What was that first spark? Let's start with that. Well, I think the first part, I was not even born. <laughs> I was still in, in my mom's stomach at that time. And apparently they went to a rock show a concert in town and um, there were drummer like bashing the drum, I guess. And, and I was pretty active. And, uh, and they told me when I, the first thing, like I was maybe like six months, eight months after I was born. And I was really asking for music in some way. Music was calming me make me active, like the music will connect to me in a young age. And, um, and yes, my family were connected to, it was really very like two kind of world. They were, they were like really into like French Canadian music or completely other part, complete like a, like a, a more UK music, like, um, more Jet Rotto, uh, uh, Led Zepp, uh, like bands like that, Rolling Stone, Beatles. So, so I grew up with those, you know, like mostly rock from, British or from with, with French Canadian music. And this is where I grew up, like my, in my young age, before I start to have a personality as a musician. But uh, right. were my first, I think it was my first uh, inspirations, I guess. And, and I remember reading somewhere, you were born in Alma, Quebec, right? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I know Alma, I've, I've played there with uh, Repercussion. I remember Alma very yeah. well in the middle of winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it can be hard to drive there in January, but it's, it's hard. Yeah, and, and then, like, did you go to music school or did you yep. just grow up playing drums? <laughs> no, yeah, actually, I was the first drum student to the first music school in Alma. So with the first class, my, my first drum teacher, my well, my official first drum teacher, I don't remember his name. Uh, it was uh, because my family wanted, like, I would take drum lessons, so they bring me to the college, music college in Alma. And uh, finally, at that time, uh, Robert Pelsi, well, yeah, yeah, the, the, the one drum teacher there. I know him, yes. So, yes, like, yes. He, he told my family, maybe he should go with, uh, with uh, one of my students. So I, but I don't remember the guy. But my first real student, teacher was Real Gagnon, a super good uh, drummer at that time. Uh, I don't know what he's, is he still playing in, in that, at this moment, but was a good percussion player too. So... Um, yeah, we opened the drum box. Like at the box, it was like, it's okay, first class, let's put the drum together and let's check it out. What is that? So we, we assembled a kit and uh, I studied there for maybe three, four years. But my family, they were really smart. They asked me, okay, you like like drums, but we won't, we, we're going to be sure you like it, but we want you to be a musical musician too at the same time. So I took violin lesson, piano and guitar. So uh, for just, you know, like, uh, like learn other music instrument is good. You know, the theory, you know. Yeah, and I start my my uh, my uh, high school and uh, all the degree, but I was uh, for the for few like last two grade I was in a, a specialty music specialty, you know, more classes and all. We went to Europe, we make competition, big band competition in Florida and stuff like that. And later, I switched in college uh, in music in Alma, 
uh, three and I did I did uh, my university uh, but split I did a year in Sherbrooke two years in Concordia so I had different teacher I have Paul Brochu I have I had like Nasir Abdullah Kabir um, uh, Syl- uh, Sylvain Jalbert and um, in Alma was Marc Bonneau uh, yes, Robert yes. Petit and Richard Dallaire that was mm-hmm. they, they were my teacher I have my, a few other but more like as a session but these they were the, my uh, my guides they were my guides yep and then did that did that take you to uh, I mean you were in Quebec City after a while or did you come to Montreal no, directly? I jumped I jumped out. I went uh, like my only time I was out of I don't know Sherbrooke City and I've been uh, in, in Sherbrooke for like I've been one year something like that and after that I jumped to uh, to um, to Montreal. Uh, just a second, again. <laughs> uh, so in, in in Montreal and um, for all my life. So it was perfect. So I stayed there for a long time. Yeah. And then how did the, I remember you started working with uh, Cavalier and I remember uh, you had invited me to that show once. I came out to the well, course. You, you, saw the, you saw the second show. You, see the, you saw the Odyssey show. Right. Yeah, the, the, the Cavalier has two shows. So I did the creation in 2003 <laughs> uh, and we, with Michel Cusson and uh, a bunch of good percussion players like Le Boivin and all those guys. So we produced the first show. And um, like producing, I mean, I, I work on the music, and we did. I did four years with the first show, and when you came, was like uh, almost at the end of the the Odyssey. Like that, I did seven years with this one. Wow, uh, it was in 2018. Uh, you came in summer. We stopped in November, so the show uh, is now is like uh, in a storage. I don't know where exactly. A part in Quebec, I think a part in the United States, but uh, in the future they're planning to do other things, but. I have other projects coming out, but I mean, it's, it's, it was a great experience. I've been working for these two shows for 11 years, maybe almost 12, so it's great. Okay. Did that come about, like, because the musicians hired you, you were working with Michel Cusson, right? Because yep. uh, he, he does a lot of those those shows. Um, yep. Did that, had, did that come about that way? Like, you were he, you didn't it's, have to do an audition. They knew already. No. Who, yeah. yeah, it is. I, I was actually working with Michel. It was funny actually because Michel is Michel, and I, I know well for him forever since ninety eight, ninety seven. And he, but the first time he called me, I, I always repeat that. But it's so funny. It's like, hey, my name is Michel, and uh, I'm a guitar player. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> so he was super stressed, and um, I didn't know what he wanted. But finally, he wanted a drummer for record uh, a soundtrack for CBC uh, or a television show. But he wanted somebody who could play like a double bass drum because it was a rock show. And so I said, yeah, I can do that. So he hired me. So I, it's, the relation started there in 98, exactly. Like my first tracking was in 98. So I started, I did, the, I don't know, like a lot of recording for him, for television, for uh, CBC or, or movies, or even soundtrack for, for publicities. You know, sometimes I walk in the street in Montreal and there's a, I mean, the shopping mall. I'm like, oh, I think it's my track, but I don't know because <laughs> you have so right, many yeah. of the track. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, we did that. And um, later on, he said, Eric, I have a project. Interesting. <laughs> Let me know. Um, and I, he, he, we, at, the, at that time, we didn't know the name of the show. The, the company name was Double Siege. So it's like, uh, it would be a show touring all around Canada, US mostly, maybe Mexico. And that's it for the moment. So I jumped, I jumped, I did the, I never did audition for the two shows because I worked with him. So I, it's very rare I did audition. Just a few times uh, for Cirque or stuff like that, but uh, it's more like connection, talk to talk, uh, you know, like, uh, and it's, it was more like making your, making, make, I can say that like, uh, you're, you're writing your own resume, you know, and you make uh, your own reputation. The people, sometimes they, they will call you for a company like a jazz band, a big band, depending on the people. But for me, it's mostly like studio recording or big production. It's mostly what I've been called for here. Uh, so, uh, but I like because I I can live a very good, good life and travel all around the world. But right? I like it. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And and the productions that Michel yeah. Michel Cusson would put together were always amazing. I I worked with him a couple of times. There was one big production where he came to my studio and we had all every instrument I have out from the taikos to, and uh, it was. It's, I mean, he's a very creative person. The the relationship between Cavalier and um, Cirque du Soleil, I mean, you were working both structures yep. of this, like they're related yep. in some form, right? 
Yeah, the owner. The owner, Norma, for, is uh, one of the founders of Cirque <laughs> with Guy. Uh, so, uh, and just saying quoi, but they split uh, and he started his own production. So, uh, yeah, but the same mentality, same same kind of idea of, uh, of shows and artists and trucking and living in a hotel or condominium, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, the ball, yeah. around the same. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell, I'm going to share a funny story with you. Um, Guy La Liberté, okay. Um, I found out later, once I was moving, when I met my wife, we, we were moving to a new house and stuff, and I'm digging up in this box, and I see this card with a phone number, Guy La Liberté, the phone number. And then I remembered he had given me this way before he started Cirque du Soleil. We had met. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> it was, and then I suddenly remembered what happened. I was playing with uh, Repercussion. He was actually working on the street. You know, he was a street performer, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And he I was know. in front of us. He was watching the show. And after Repercussion, we were playing this outside concert. I think it was on Saint Denis when the uh, Montreal Jazz Festival was uh, doing some concerts there. So he and I got into this very long conversations about dreams, about ideas, and. And then, you know, we spoke about, you know, when you're a creative person, you just have flow of ideas. So he said, here's my phone number. Call me. <laughs> and then I never called him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, life is not a coincidence. Sometimes you just things happen or they don't happen. You show up or yep. you don't show up. Right. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent of that. Yep. It's funny. And you go with the flow and you would, yeah, well, and yeah, he was working there. It's from a. La Malbe, and he was uh, working there too. So it was a small role. Huh? So, yes, yes. And he, of course, he was he was brilliant. You know, Cirque, Cirque du Soleil with no animals, that whole concept. That was brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I still, were, I mean, still is. Yeah. And, yeah, and they work all around the world. Huh? They're representing. I remember a long time ago, before I started working for Cirque, like uh, part-time, I been one, uh, I was in Korea, in Seoul, with another company uh, doing a, a big festival there. Well, like back in 2010, and uh, we had, I only have a, one or two days off. And one of my days off, it was to visit, I was to visit the, uh, the Olympic Stadium. But I, I didn't know Cirque were there. So they, they, they were with Alegria on the, on the, on the field. And we uh, have friends. So uh, some people, I couldn't catch the show, but some friends on tour with us, some technician could have check it out, uh, the show uh, over there. But it's fun. It's cool because you realize how the world is big, but it's small at the same time. You're like completely far away from home and there's one of the biggest show in town in Seoul, in Seoul is Cirque. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's impressive. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. Now that, I mean, the, the nice, the nice thing and very interesting that, you know, when we talk about music, it, it is really uh, another language. So those of us who oh, speak yeah. music, <clears throat> speak this language that all, everyone understands in one form or another. It's amazing. Yeah, and it's the, it's a magical thing. I just did like the drum press for Ralph in September 22, and I was sharing the stage. Uh, I was doing the end show with uh, with Senri, the, the drummer, the girl from Japan, and she's she barely can speak English. She have a very limited English. Uh, even the, the the guy taking care of her, super cool guy, but barely speak English too. Like I mean, he he, he speak, but we, like you cut corners, you know. So so, but we jump on drum. I never hear and it's music. Right. Were, the music was our our way to connect and we can you know sometimes you don't connect it's it happens you know the there's musician it won't connect for, for reasons of i don't know but uh, for for me and her directly connected you know i have a big background of latin music too so uh like and every time i go to like like you can go to cuba or like uh, here in, when i'm in mexico or other latin country even if i don't i speak spanish now but before not so I could my playing music was my way to talk with them, and I was about to connect like like right away. You know, it's a super good way to connect. Sure, no, no, and that and that's the great thing about playing music, and percussion in particular, but music in general. I mean, I mean, I mean, but, I mean, I know you've traveled around the world, and, and you know, I have too. In every situation you're in, you don't speak the language. I mean, we would be in Korea and playing with Samuel Nori, yeah, no words. Yeah. But we played and we did a concert together. It would be, uh, I was once in, uh, one of the last times I was in Beijing, because I would go to China every year. I was sitting in the audience and there was this traditional thing going on on stage. And somebody saw me from the side and he recognized me. 
and sent somebody to get me to go back and they threw me on stage just just to play with them and the guy says no no don't worry don't worry no it's all hands right but the moment yeah, you play yeah, yeah, yeah. the moment you play <laughs> it doesn't matter it's because it you, doesn't you, matter it, you understand right <laughs> it's amazing yeah, yeah. how fortunate yeah, yeah, we yeah. are oh yeah yeah, the, and it's not just music, and it's just uh, communicating with looking at the person, like uh, how they, they will move, uh, what they will do, because sometimes even if the music is there, you will, we will be able as a mission to read their body uh, before, you know, I always say, I'm, I always check the chord where the keyboard, or, or like which chord are they going to go, even if I can hear it, sometimes I can expect the guitar player, what is movement, so I know we have a build up like a show free or it's going to come down, you know? So, so it's, it's music is magical and not everybody can live that. And I, I, I always say you really should at least be a music for fan, but at least listening some music if they don't want to play, because it's going to bring some joy to them, you know, in some ways. Sure. Sure. And, and it, and it's funny because, you know, in the educational system, mm -hmm. globally speaking, especially in North America, they're taking all the fun out, and especially music and, and the arts. And I, and I, was just, I just had a conversation this morning with a school who reached out to us if we would do something. I said, you know, I have a little frustration, and now I can speak to you directly. Why are they taking the fun out of school? <laughs> we used to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. they said, yep. you're right. <laughs> it's crazy. We, we, it's must, crazy. we must insist, because... You know, if you don't have uh, the fun, you don't have the creativity, then we're building, we're, we're educating people who <clears throat> think they're going to be robots. That's, I mean, technology is great, but humanity is still needs to be there, right? Yeah, mu music it was a, part, a big part. I remember when I was a kid in high school, um, it was one way to hang out with the, or making friends, you know, and discovering things you won't discover and if you stay at in your in your house, you know, you're only watching your Instagram or TikTok because, I mean, I learned all the big band music, like from Buddy Rich to Krupa to all those guys, but other people, you know, and if you're a kid uh, of 16 and like, let's say 13, 14 years old, and you're listening like uh, only hip hop is cool, but at the same time, it's not because you're listening to that music and you're listening to the other music, you will be less cool. It's just better for you because you always say, more doors open you have, better you will be. So if, if you restrain yourself at one canal, well, it's cool. Maybe you'll be the best person in that or the best musician, but at the same time, you will, you will have less language exactly for to, to talk. I, um, I, I won't point nobody, but I'm, my, my, my idea is like, for example, when I was a kid, I, I jumped in punk rock and metal. Okay. And I realized, uh, one day I didn't have enough vocabulary to just play a blues. You understand? Like if you go to a jam session, you won't play like a, like a, a technical odd meter music. You know, you will do a, a the Beatles song or Rolling Stone, like a Rolling Stone, like a, you will do like a, like a classic blues from CCR. You, you know, you need those. So I have to learn them. So I start to, and in a young age, I realized I was like, well, was good. Doing crazy stuff, but I couldn't play with a band, the bass player. So I decided to, okay, I'm going to learn that. So I went, I found a band and we, we just, our objective was not to so at first, was to just make cover. So I think I, I did two, three hundred covers. I have no idea, but classic, like just classic song. And now I still have them. If maybe I don't know, I don't remember all the punches, but I know them by heart. So if I, if you put me on stage, I will be maybe at 90% close to the, what the song is, but it's made me, I can play with everybody now. You know, it's, it's, it's something. The, like you said, if they cut found those kids, they don't have access to stuff like that. And, uh, and it's sad in some ways. It's very sad. Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And <laughs> one of the things that comes up all the time with a lot of the guys that I've been speaking with is, and, and that, that was my experience, you start playing along to records. And then the records, and you play in a band, and you learn those songs, and then you expand whatever music you're playing, whether it's uh, Santana stuff at the time or Creedence Clearwater back then, to yep. Chicago, to whatever is coming Chicago. up next. So you're you're learning the repertoire, you're learning uh, the voice of the drums in the songs, you're learning uh, s structures, you're learning <clears throat> styles you're, you're without really realizing, and you're and you're pushing it. And of course, those of us who were fortunate enough to to study 
at university and, and take it beyond, then that expands too. But it all mm -hmm. began with playing. You know, whether you're you're playing with, with records or what you did is kind of the same idea of having the vocabulary and building that and knowing and being comfortable at least at a level where you you have a starting point mm -hmm. and and you are in in the game, so to speak, right? Yep. And that's important. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, like the uh, I'm I still teach not full time at all. I have a few, I have around 10 students. I cannot have more, but uh, normally I have five to 10 students. I take a few, uh, a few uh, students, uh, like uh, on the side when I have time for those. But my point is like, um, I have a student like recently asked me like, uh, sometimes I think it's boring to learn the rudiments. So, uh, but I said, well, because maybe, because I, I, it was maybe his third class or second class with me. So I said, well, let's try to find a way to learn them. Uh, and to practice them because they're boring ways and they're good ways, but also it can be a traditional ways to learn them. But it, you need, if you do it the right way and have an, a good amount of time, you don't burn yourself, you will enjoy it. So there's always a way to do. It. And but my point where I want to go with that is like, um, I told him, well, but there's things you cannot, you can do by yourself, but at some point in your life, if you want to be a professional musician or at least a, a good musician, um, you have to pass through these ways yeah, to perfection your double. You don't need to be the number one percussion like drummer with double stroke on the world. But if you, you need to have clean double, clean single, parallel, but we can find ways. So I found ways to, you can practice those in group, but in, in a pad, watching TV, uh, in his, in, on his snare, in his studio. So, so, but his vocabulary, like you say, like I mean, a guitar player, if you say, I don't want to learn like, like these chords because they are boring. Well, perfect. But what you will do when you will go through them, like a C major, a, you know, like if you have to, it's a, it's a, it's a path. You cannot jump. You can learn by you, by you here. Some people are super good by here, but there's limitation. When I did like, uh, I didn't do much, but when I did hotel and cruise ship and stuff like that. You need to have a good sight reading. You need to read well or have a medium good reading, you know? So, um, so I always, I made, I'm medium good. I cannot say I'm the best at all. I'm medium good because I, I, I don't know. I didn't spend that many time. I have punches, but I said, you need to read a bit. And so I'm like, yeah, but I, I don't care. My bands, I, I like to play. Uh, they don't, they don't necessarily, I don't need to read the music. They say, yeah, but most of them, your musician, you like, they are, they are able to read music. Of course. Oh, yeah. 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 For sure. So it's stuff like that. When you cut down, like you say, just for finish that topic, like uh, because of my point is like when you cut down, the the you, you don't have the, the kid won't read music necessarily. They will have a lot of things they won't have access to, so they will be um, maybe I won't say less, not, not less um, good in what they do, but they just have less accessibilities. And I will say that I will put this way. Sure. No, no, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And, and the way I, I put it, uh, Ed, Eric, is, is it's the same as when we're born, we learn the language that we're it, that our environment gives us, and you can speak, so there's no problem. But at some point, uh, you're conscious, and somebody puts, gives you a, you see a sign. Imagine you can't read it. Imagine you can't send somebody a text. Now, now that language now has to have a means of communication. So if you can't transmit that to somebody or somebody gives you here, here's an idea and they have to show it to you, then it becomes laborious. So it doesn't really work. So you become really limited with, you know, that's exactly what you're saying. And then as I said, reading gives you that. So the better you, the reader you are, and we're all readers of text to a, a lesser or greater degree. I don't read a hundred books a day. Some people no, do. <laughs> Some people read a lot. I used to read a lot when yeah, I had a yeah. lot more time, <laughs> but at least I can. So, you know, and I, and I, you know, one realizes, depending on, depending on, on what you want to do. I mean, if you want to be a studio musician, you want to do that side of things. <clears throat> of course you have to yeah. read. And that was one of the things I always did. I, I read until I was blue in the face. So I could say, I could, I can read, I can go in and read a show cold practically. And, but, but so that's for some of us, others just, just to know what it is so they can actually get a piece of paper and what they see is what, what they hear. So now you put the two together, just like that's a language, exactly. right? Same thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, right. you know, your, your point is, is well taken and, and it's important for people. It's not that you have to learn to read, but if you do, 
it certainly adds a lot to your your world. It's, yeah, it's not just counting, just counting. For example, like if you you put like uh, the other day, I was one my drum solo from uh, my friend Rick Layton and uh, with one student. Uh, because Rick is a is a friend, and I always like uh, the way he's working, cool guy. So what I did, I was trying my, to explain counting. So I took the the book of my student, and I was like, I was putting like one plus or one en or two, whatever. I was and and it was complete. I realized it was completely lost in translation. So I we start the process. How I catch him is because he starts to play the solo, and he has an issue at let's say bar ten. And I'm like, can you repeat that? You couldn't. You have to restart from scratch. I realized he was only going on YouTube, watching the video and learning by heart or what he was hearing and, and seeing. But he couldn't know where he was on the chart. So I we start the process to write everything. Uh, the, not everything, but at least the, the the one, two, three, four. And when there's difficulties we can have, it changes life. Now he's super good. He can read a lot. He, now he progress way more because when you have a, a question or an interrogation point, instead to wait the next class, he can do it himself. So now, sometimes you come to class, hey, I did, uh, I don't know, like three pages of stick control, whatever, and I don't, I now I know how to do it, and he showed me what he did. So I really enjoyed that because he can really progress way faster, like uh, than before. Like it's, it cannot be equal than before. So, yeah. It's just tricks like that. And and I always say, if you don't want to learn crazy, you can do lead sheet. I teach that to my student to like do a lead sheet, like just like a counter bar. I, if they know, so I, I'm making them counting one, two, three, four, whatever it is in four, four. They count the number of bar with divided and group of four, eight, depends on the page. And if there's some, when they're better, I can make like coda or repeat and stuff like that. If not, we go straight pages. Like if it's 10 pages, we'll go 10 pages. But at least they can understand when, where they are. And after we short, so we make a, 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 a bar with eight bar, uh, eight. Uh, like, you know, they, so they can visualize the song without to be too much digging in it with all the, the, the quarter notes and stuff like that. So it's, it's something it helped for sure, like for growing as a musician too. Yeah, no, no, that's for sure. I mean, and speaking of Rick Latham, he was, uh, we worked a lot together. He did our uh, Cosa Italy when we did that, and mm. we worked together in China quite often also. That was oh, yeah, a lot great of fun. Guy. He's, he's, he's a great guy, great teacher and great player. But I wanted to ask you, uh, speaking of um, going back to reading and studio, you did, um, you did a lot of work uh, on the X-Files, the, the show, right? I did a few. I did a few. Yeah, but okay. not a lot, but I did because I was uh, in Los Angeles for a few, for a year uh, working in studios and doing only re studio recording. So I was like a, a ghost tracking guy. So so uh, you were, if the drummer was not enough good on one album, sometimes they were calling me. I was uh, got a call like two, three days before, going at night. Sometimes it was the day before and recording in studio. Uh, I was actually at Sound City Studio. The people, they, they know the studio. So, um, yeah, I did, uh, I did a few television, uh, soundtrack, like, uh, like X Fire, Big Love, uh, many others, like, uh, like, uh, I have a few list of them. So sometimes it was very funny. And sometimes they hire, I remember one track for X Love was only a crash. They hire me. I showed up in the studio. I have, they said, don't, don't set up your drum, just put percussions and stuff because it was, uh, they have some equipment in the studio itself. So I arrive, I put my things and finally, they said, okay, in this, we want uh, one hit of a symbol and one row. So I'm like, okay. So it was only that. It was like a push and a, a shrill. And that's it. That was my day for the, the, for the recording. But it's, that, this is what they wanted. So it's fun. You never know. You never know. That's right. And you never know where these things uh, lead you. And what, why were you going? What led you to Los Angeles? Was that part of your plan and part of your voyage? But it's because, well, uh, I just finished, that was in 2007, we're back in the days. So uh, I was just finishing Cavalier and uh, I was quitting the tour because I was feeling I needed to do other things. So, and I had an opportunity to work there with a visa at that time. So uh, like a sponsorship. So I decided to go. So I've been there a year, uh, almost a year, like uh, I think 10 months because I back to Montreal and finally I didn't stop. Up. I work crazy with you know, stuff like with different companies and I don't have regrets. So, so yeah, I, the people they, they think about that is yeah, I'm going to go to Los Angeles and live the American dreams and stuff like that. It's super cool. 
but at the same time be ready. It's expensive. Um, it's hard uh, to, to go around because it's not like Toronto or Boston where you can take a subway and be a, like in everywhere you want fast. You know, it's hard. But the people don't, they don't know that sometimes, you know. So I have to figure out my, I was living close to Remo uh, in Valencia. So if I have to go down south, it was two, three hours with traffic. But, um, but it was a great time. I, I, I learned so many people. One day I was recording there. So you go in that square and I was uh, working in one studio. And that day Metallica they were recording their album, uh, Frank Tanger. And uh, at that time, so two, three times, we have a com- they have private room, but we have one common cafeteria and they were showing up and just sitting on the table. I'm not the kind of guy to ask pictures all the time. So because I think it's not respectful, even if you're fun, you want, because you want to feel you're cool and you're friendly and there is a cool, cool environment. So a few times, a lot of artists, they were showing up and we just talk with them and they're super happy because they don't feel aggressive with, with the parades and things like that. And this, I learned that from scratch, you know, from who? I learned that from, uh, from Neil Peart. Because Neil Perk came at my show in 2006 and uh, 2005, I don't remember. And someone told me, Eric, the drummer from Rush is in the VIP tent. I'm like, probably not. So, uh, so I'm like, okay. If I showed up, I went to the VIP after. And, but uh, someone said, yeah, he's there. He's waiting for you. He wants to meet you. It was real. It was for real. He wanted to talk with me. So I spent two hours with Neil. So just talking, actually talking about things cool. You know, like we didn't talk about like, uh, I don't know, like uh, what kind of snare stand are you using? Yeah, you know, no, we talk about his motorcycle, his trips, uh, uh, like uh, how he can, because sometimes he's nervous, how he can lay down, relax, breathe, um, food. Yeah, we talk about a lot of foods and, you know, and I never asked a picture because feeling if I will do that, I will break a wall of oh, respect yes. and I never ask picture. So we, so, but I don't mind. It's for me. It's my souvenir for me. So, so, and, and he gave me his phone number and I, I call him uh, what, what, like one time, but it was very cool, but I never did that. And the day after we got a call, the, the manager for Neil Kirk was an happy spent one hour. It was one hour and a half with me, uh, without, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't get the nuts. So, so he was not happy. So my production came back to me like, you. Next time you need to tell us, well, I didn't know, nobody told me that, but you know, like, I didn't know the processing of all that, you know, and I was yes. green. I was 20 years ago. So, you know, 20 years ago, uh, yes. I was, I was a kid. So I didn't know. Yeah. And later on, I was in the double factory, like in 2016 or 17. And, uh, I pick a drum like randomly for, for, for a drum channel, actually for, for one session there. And, um, and John Good uh, is like, hey, you pick the drum for uh, Neil Bird. I will tell him. So he texted him, <laughs> say, Eric is taking your drum. So he, he was supposed to come, but finally he didn't come. He was asking me to, but like, he got as well. Tell him to enjoy because Neil, when he was uh, uh, around uh, DW Factory, he has a kit there for rehearsing. But he's not the big kit with the roll and pad, the stage drill on the floor. He said, it's a normal drum, like two tom, two four bass drum, two snare, a couple of stambles, or just real <laughs> rears. And when you do, nobody tell nobody because you will have like people making lines for autographs. So you just show up, they put the drum there and he rehearse a few days for himself. Sometimes it was not for Rush, it was just for, he wants to play drum in a good environment, trying to snare, you know, and meet the, 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 the guys at DW. So it's, more, it's mostly like that. But yeah, I learned to, to be on ball and these people are great people normally. So yeah, it's cool to, to, to stay on ball with them, talk with them. And that's it. Yeah, yep. it was no, a you said, funny you, story, you, uh, one of my, <laughs> a multiple one. <laughs> no, you said it correctly. I mean, the the humility factor is important. And and I think Neil was probably one of the epitomes of that. And then, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, Neil and I knew each other for over 30 years. Yeah, and, you have a kit for Neil, Mike, where you have yes. a drum. Uh, well, actually, he, yeah. uh, I mean, we were supposed to, It was. this is a f- funny story. We met over the years many times, and then I thought, Neil would be great because to me, he was like the classical percussionist um, turned completely rock in that world. I said, how about we do, um, no, actually somebody had asked me to do a a show. Uh, 
Canadian of Canadian drummers, <clears throat> and it said who would who would be um, people you might want. So I I said, well, we'll we'll do this show. You know, a typical production that that I would do is have repercussion, some guests, and put the whole show around this. And we've done it in in Toronto at Roy Thompson Hall. We did it in Quebec for the the Tall Ships Festival. We did a number of them. One at at the, at, the, at at Canadian Parliament, July first, they did a big show, and then when they asked me this, I said, "I have a great idea, repercussion with Neil Peart and a few other people." And I had the concept in my mind, and and I'm talking to Neil, and he's and he said, "I, I don't really see it, but now nah, let's talk about it." And then one day we had um, <clears throat> over the years, he came to see us in Toronto, and the next day he sent me a, a note. So I was at your show last night. I didn't want to come backstage to to, to uh, disturb you guys. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I saw exactly what you were talking about. Because, you know, with repercussion, we all play all the instruments. We had an African dancer. <clears throat> and we had even Oliver Jones as a special guest at this show. It was at CBC. And so he says, "I now I totally understand what you meant. And, and I think it would be great. I said, these are t complete opposites. People would not... Not even imagine what this could be. So just just that alone will get people curious. But what, but cool. what we could do would be so amazing and so much fun. Never mind anything; it'd be so much fun. No. So then, when he saw, it, he said, "This I I totally see it." So rather than do a show, let's do a record. Oh, yeah, so I said, sense. "Sure." So and this was, uh, you know, unfortunately, the just before he lost his daughter and his wife. So yeah. that was happening all at the same time. So then the project got canned and then we didn't speak for a few years, of course, because he left, you know, you know the story. Yep. And then uh, finally, when he came back, he, you know, he, he reached out and we started speaking again. I never referred to that, that whole project, that whole thing. But then I said, you know, what would be really cool is if you just showed up as just as a special guest, but unannounced at COSA, at the camps. And without saying anything, we'd just, we'd just talk. He says, yeah, that's an idea, but let's let's find a time to do it. And I would just every once in a while I check, Neil, are you uh, are you around? If you like it, and he said, no, we're on this tour, this tour. All of, all of a sudden, one year, uh, he writes back, sends me an email. He says, Aldo, your timing is perfect. I'm at my house in Morin Heights, you know, because he had a house up there, yep. uh, not far from Montreal. And he says, my family doesn't come up his new family, who was in a loss, based in Los Angeles at the time, right? He says, they're not coming up for a couple of weeks, so this is perfect. Let's, let's go down. I said, perfect. I will register, I'll register you at, at a local hotel under a fictitious name so nobody knows anything. I won't tell anybody you're, you're coming. This is to be top secret. Not even our techs will know. And it will just, you know, we'll just talk. And, and so then he writes me back. He said, uh, I'm working on my... Um, my video, you know, the last video he did, he says, maybe we can uh, use some of this. We can get the guys from Hudson to come out and uh, record Shut some up. of this and put right. it in the film. I said, sure. I said, as a matter of fact, that's a great idea because I, we have uh, people from the, uh, some radio, from TV show coming in and doing a documentary on COSA in Vermont. So we're going to have a crew there and, and the guys at Hudson don't even have to show up because that'll, that will be a giveaway. Like, what are you doing? We have already have a crew <laughs> filming. And uh, no, it was NPR. That's right. They're coming to do a, a documentary. I said, perfect. They're already on site. So we'll get, we'll make arrangements to have some of the footage. We'll do extra footage for us. And we'll just have this conversation. Beautiful. Then he, uh, he writes back. He says, you know what? Let's play. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. I said, that's fabulous. I said, now I have to tell the techs because we have to get the the instruments in gear. And I couldn't tell them until the last minute because then, you know, somebody could slip. And so it was a season. Anyway, he, he came down. We played. We interviewed the whole thing. I mean, we had a long talk about it. We had everybody in the, in the room and we talked a lot. And then I had something prepared with some of the guys. And I said, let's just wing it. And then we just jump okay. from one thing to another. So this is, one day we'll, we'll release this. This was a, amazing. <laughs> so, it's, it's actually a very good story. It's, uh, yeah. it's impressive because uh, 
I, I, I wish I could have been there. <laughs> I, I, could, I sure could be there. It was yeah. a great uh, moment for sure. But, but I mean, the, the point, the whole point is, I mean, this guy has reached such a musical level, but he was the most um, humble. And that's the, you know, getting back to your word of humility. I mean, it, you know, it's not taking what yourself seriously. It's taking what you do seriously, because we are just fortunate to be that person who's, who's doing this. And, and of course, you do the work. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's you have a much better life, just enjoying life and and working hard at what you do, and as he did, and he was enjoying it, he, and he was not walking around having to to deal with who he was or who that name was. He was just an ordinary person to himself, and uh, it's perfect. It's amazing. Yeah, beautiful. That's a great example, you know. And he's it's to amazing. me one of one of the guys who really showed that it can be done, it should be done. I mean, I learned early that no matter what you do, it's, you know, you're just lucky to, to, to have been part of that in whatever form, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's um, you know, like the, the more you meet people like that, you realize like they are in their own world some, 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 a lot of time because the people see them in different ways, but they are yeah. humans. So when you, be, you break that wall and you, they make they have a confidence like i mean they can connect with you and they and you see you're not a threat for them yeah. like in the center there are cool people and they will op open their and it will be nice like uh, i can make do name dropping forever i have not, I met so many people but i remember meryl street came to the show they asked me to meet her like just me like before we were like three artists an acrobat me as a first representing the musician and I think it was one of the GBAs was a, like a guy from Guinea, like a, like a black guy, full muscle, crazy good person. And and uh, she arrived and, and she was so shy, but shy. Like she talked with her acrobats and I was like, like I, I, I wish I could be good like you guys. And she was talking like to us like a fan it was very weird. Yeah. And but finally we said no, it's okay. So at the end we start talking about like uh, not just about like life and the kids were and we start to just walk around, show the setup and and. And uh, we ask her, you want to go for coffee or something? Yeah. So we said, uh, and we're like, just ch the chatting. And, you know, it's, it's an example of what I have, like, a million of those. So, so yeah, it's, uh, I can understand with Neil. And uh, and it's cool for him, too, for him to understand that because he's playing with his band Rush. And I was going to your show doing something completely out of the blue, <laughs> on a, you know, playing, like, talking first and not playing drums. But not his things, you know. So yeah. for him, for him, I'm sure I can put money on the table. He was probably more stressed to do this than do a rush in front of like five, fifty thousand people because it's completely new thing with some friends, you know, like you and uh, like close friend, but oh. public, but not big public. You know what I mean? Like so, I'm sure he was stressed more than what he do now. Oh, I, I know that for a fact because he, he he afterwards he says, you know, I hate people like you because you guys are, you you're so good at <laughs> everything, all of these things. And as a Neil, you know, don't no, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I mean, his big fear was improvising, of course, but um, he had this creativity. I said, you know, you have taken this creativity, but also you're a person who can communicate this. And this is what, you know, would be great for you to be able to transmit this knowledge and this capacity. Also, as the drummer for Rush, this, you know, it's so you can put two words together. Most people think that drummers or musicians on that level can't speak. You could be a professor at Harvard, and you're a perfect example of the, the, the thinking person, the thinking musician. And, you know, musicians are a lot more... Um, have a lot more going because of a lot more moving parts. We're about solving issues, solving problems, and we're always in the solving department, right? I mean, you you know that totally. every second, you know, it could be technically something. You have to play in time. You have to you have to have the the right taste, the right thing. So it's always a and a constant yep. resolve, which is beautiful. This is a, a great challenge we have. Yeah, and then they can put put. This in perspective, when you're a musician, okay, let's say you're a professional musician, you go on a gig, not with your gear. Okay, sometimes you're fortunate. You have a great gear. You have like, like I'm checking your studio now. You have more perk, like Henry Ludwig and stuff like that for you. And you have great gear. But they say, okay, I'll do, you're going to do a show in Argentina. There's a, you ask for a, like a technical, like spec, you know, 
your show up is not what you ask for, you know, but you have to make it happen. It's hard when you think about that professional mission, but you have to adapt, like you said, to the theater, the technician, the language, the gear, the music. There's a lot of things uh, you, you need to be really proactive uh, uh, if you want to be a, a professional musician. Because it's the dream situation happen, but not a lot. It's not, right. it's not a big part of your uh, of the reality, actually. No, no, you know? and it, it happens more often than not when you arrive, and yep. it's just not that. So, I mean, even things like uh, you're on, you know, you're in the audience, and somebody invites you to perform with them. I, this happened to me in Cuba. I remember the first time it happened where Piloto with <coughs> with. Piloto. Um, um, the climax, you know, the, his big band, and they were amazing. They yes, were so climax. tight and it's so like so energetic. It was amazing. So he calls me up and I and I'm sitting on the drums and I'm playing, and I couldn't hear anything. And I'm saying to myself, I'm looking for the monitors, and I'm saying, how do they do this? I I couldn't hear anything. All of a sudden, my antennas. When <laughs> I'm so high, and then they asked me to play some congas. I sat in and I'm. I said, I could barely hear the congas. I could barely hear anybody. But out there, they sounded amazing, tight, and then smiling, dancing. It was great. I couldn't hear a thing. So I'm holding on to dear life. <laughs> I'm praying. <laughs> that, I mean, I landed fine. But boy, that was not. It's hard. Eh? Oh, man. Like, you just never know. You just never know. And you're always solving <clears throat> solving the, the thing for yourself. You have to be part of the thing, not the problem. Say, well, I, I can't do that because I don't have. No, no. Yeah, no, no. no, no. You make it work. You, you, you make it work. You adapt. You need to let go stuff. Like I learned when I don't, um, I don't hear much, I will play really simple things, but make it groove just to be sure that people will be happy to hear, you know, like the song, because you play for the song at the end. So, uh, yeah, uh, because, uh, yeah, sometimes you don't have in-ears, Sometimes the monitors are not working well, uh, the reverb, you know, so you have to deal with that, you know, like a, a bass drum kicking the wall coming to you, you know, like a delay. It's hard to play with that too. There's a lot of circumstances that people doesn't know, but it's important to work with when you're a musician. Yeah. And, and I mean, knowing what I know about you, you're, you're all in constant motion from one project to another, wherever you are on the planet. What, what is the thing that, uh, that drives you and, in, in all of this, I it's it's for me. Uh, I always I don't think uh, uh, I can say that. I know artists. Some artists need to be seen to be happy. Uh, some artists need to be. Everybody is good. I mean, like, everybody needs recognition or be happy. For me, it's just like uh, I need to keep my head busy, uh, and I'm giving you challenges because. And it's not the challenges is only profitable. I mean, money, the money wise. I mean, I don't care. I mean, for that, it's like more like I really need to have different challenges for growing as a person and as a musician. Uh, for example, I wrote a first drum book in 2012, but it took me five years to do it before uh, because it was a side project. Like, and um, and I realized, oh, I need to put all that in a computer. So you know, so it just took me more time. You now I just did the second book, like I released it in September twenty two, um, and uh, it was it's not it's a beta version. I I printed out a few, but it was for the drum test. But uh, I'm finishing it now because there's a few mistakes and it, I have to rush it so crazy. But <clears throat> I don't believe in excuses. Uh, I don't believe in uh, I can say that um, uh, you need to deal with stress situation. Uh, we're not made in chocolate. We're not princess. You know, you have to make it happen, like you say. So whatever happened for me, I always think if I think before 2,000 person, 5 person, um, I have a deadline for do something, I always try to make it the best as I can. Um, so it just drives me. Because if not, I, my, uh, I will die as a musician. And I, uh, I'm a, I know some musicians are very uh, linear. It's good. Like, I mean, I'm linear in my personality, but... As a musician, I like waves, but what I mean with that is like, I can be full teaching, not full, but like 70% teaching for one year. And after I don't want students because I will lose that momentum. So I prefer I have less and I will do more project. Sometimes it will be more like, like recording studio. So I, I, I know some like session drummer or musician, they like to do a lot of different things at the same time. I like to do it too, but I prefer to take one or two and do it very good than be 
like an, on 10 projects and do it not that good. I, I stayed up because I learned by my mistakes. We're, not, we're all different. And I tried to be that session guy uh, beginning of 2008, 9, 7, after my, when I back from California to uh, 2008, 2009, and I jumped in 20 projects at the same time, doing like big shows in Montreal, in Toronto, going to the West, like doing a lot of things. And I remember I did a show and it wasn't a good show. And the, 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 the when guy came, she was like, well, Eric, you didn't, you didn't do well this time at all. So that shocked me a lot. But the good way, I realized I can, I can be a session, but just put resources, not 25 projects. And uh, you need to understand that as a musician uh, to know who you are. And, uh, and that's why, this is what it drives me now. Like I like to have something I really like. So you see now, now I have a, a new project coming soon. Uh, I'm still teaching. Um, I'm, I'm an artistic project manager too. I like to do stuff linked to music or art, but I'm not drumming. So this, I discovered that in 2012, uh, 13, I don't know. The people doesn't know that, but I do that on a, on a side, but I like it. So sometimes I would work on one project, like project, like music and projection and, uh, or like a setup of a, like a, a big DJ uh, boot. And I would work on the lights and how, we, and this make me happier when I jump on the drum after because I, 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 I'm still in the, in the industry, but I don't need to play drum all the time. You know, I can do other, I can be another person and, and it's working well. I can, I like it. And that's another way to drive me more as a drummer. Now I need to back to practice more. I realize I, I, um, a lot of people during the pandemic were practicing, they were like under instruments all the time. Not me. I practice more normally, but now I realize I need to back, uh, to the rooms. I want to redo all the, the, um, Mitchell book, you know, like the, the stick control, uh, Peter, like all the, 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 the basic book, like, uh, like a syncopation. I want to repass them in different ways. I always do just for cleaning. I like to back on, to back to basic and, and, and go further up after that. It's just better for me as a mission. And it's clear more your hands and the way you play. Sure. Well, now you're more mature to, to be able to do that. And that's what it takes a certain maturity. And also, yeah. What you're saying is, 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 is balance, you know, uh, balance is good. Sometimes you have to step away from something to, to appreciate it and also to let it digest and, and yep. then to take off in another direction. And I mean, it, it's certainly COVID, uh, that whole lockdown, uh, was treated differently. Right. I mean, treated us each in a different way. I mean, it, for yep. me, I didn't do so much more practicing as, as catching up to things I never in my life had time to do. <laughs> so I said, okay, everybody's in the same boat. Nobody's going anywhere. And it was a few years of, you know, I had recorded all of these things. I had, we had filmed all the COSA stuff or 25 years oh, of yeah. COSA archive. So we digitized everything. I said all the repercussion world tours and, and way from way back audio and video. I said, I have to put that. It's got to be out there just to, just for people to see it and, and archive it and make it eventually cool. available. And then I started this podcast. I said, I've got to do something because I'm not able to, I don't even know what an airplane looks like anymore. And sometimes <laughs> I would go out, I would go out and I'd see when they, when we see one airplane, I'd see, Wow, like you're a kid, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, oh, and, yeah. And, and then, you know, I had a whole bunch of inventions that I had created, and I never had time to patent them because it's just so long. So I, they were there. So that whole time, I just did all those things that were of interest to me and all these patents that I created. And I now they're, they're starting to get out that one of them is, is going to be launched this year. It's a special music stand for, for mallets. And oh, Man cool. Manhasset is, is going to uh, produce it, and, uh, and it's re being released so this cool. year. So, I mean, we sometimes we do it by uh, by design, and sometimes we're forced in a situation where you say, "Okay, well, since I that's not going to happen, I'm going to do something else." So you you creative, maybe not as a drummer necessarily, like you say, but you create your balance, right? Yep. Yeah. Now, oh, yeah. what would and what it's, would you? It's, a, it's, it's just for me it was good. What would you say to somebody who wants to be, um, you know, the, I mean, in this day and age where, where music is going and, you know, a lot of the touring, a lot of the big shows, because you're involved in a lot of major productions, have been for a while. 
like the Cirque and uh, Cavalier and, and those types of shows. And shows, I'm, I'm sure that will be coming up, the one that you're uh, looking forward to do fairly soon. Um, someone who wants to get into that world, what would you suggest to a person like that? But I would I would split that in a couple of different answers because it's more like um, different. Uh, that, that you need a few different things. Uh, first, if I go more like in the technical side, uh, you need to know to work with a computer. Uh, and same thing, there's no excuses. If you say, "Oh, I don't know the programs," so, okay, too bad. So it so will pass to another person. So it's really like that. So you can say, "Yes, I know," but you don't know. <laughs> go to to learn it and and learn i didn't do that but i mean i for example i work with logic and ableton live most of the time and even get right then for running my little track sometimes but um but i would say you need at least one recording program it can be cubase logic pro tool whatever you feel comfortable with it's you need one to know you need to know perfect you need to know uh, at least to take your sound card actually you need to know what is a sound card uh, you need to learn that, connect your computer, have one microphone for start, you can put as an overhead, make some tests, even your, vo your voice. This is the first step and be able to record and it's a, not big editing. You, you don't need to have like different curves go or like in the, like um, all the details of that, but just like a recording, cutting tracks. This is a good step. Second, you need to know a program. You can uh, trigger things. It can be uh, SPDS six, for example, from Roland. I'm just it's not for meaning a brand, but it's an example of a, a pad you can eat. But this pad can also have sound. The, 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 ex, the sound can be in the machine, but most of the time in this version is not. It will be in a computer, and it can be in, the, in your computer as a drummer or percussion player or you know, the musical director. But but you need to know a basis of it. There's a few out, out there, um, very good. The most popular is about in live, but you can know a few. Same thing, you don't need to know all, okay, just a few ways you can start your tracks and that's it. So this is a part. And you need after that to be able to um, uh, to travel and to, um, I mean, passport ready. Uh, even if now it's done, you need to, some countries, some companies will have to, a vaccine passport or at least two vaccines. It's weird, but it's, it happens. I know some companies asking for that. If it's like that, you have to respect that if you want the contract. If it, it's part of the game, maybe in 24 it will be done, but 2023, I know some companies are requesting this thing. Um, you need to be uh, ready to, to live in hotel, um, eating there, not the food you're eating all the time. So this is something. People doesn't understand. Live with the same. Live with the like working with the musician. But live with the musician at the same time too. Uh, can be bad. I mean, sometimes we. I, I heard and I seen. I've been involved in situations. Sometimes it doesn't connect. Um, it's life. Uh, sometimes you you see the guitar uh, not happy with something. You start player and is fighting with the singer. So it's, it's stuff you need to to be able to do. This is uh, one part. The other, other part is that you need at least. You don't need to read the best, as, as we say, but you need to be able to read at least punches, a chart, a base chart, like a, a, or a line, uh, like a, and you know where you, you are in the chart, even if it's not the, the, the if you're not the best reader. Um, <clears throat> you need to be multi instrumentalist, I would say, I would put this way. Before it was a reality, you can be a new drummer, but now you need to be a drummer. If you're the, okay, let's say I talk about the drummer. If you're a drummer, you need to take, to be a bit of percussion player. Maybe not at your level, uh, I do, but maybe able to play, like to know some, some conga pattern, uh, you know, like some stuff you can, you can play. And I know, I heard stories, guys, and saying like, I'm a drummer, I'm not a percussion player, or I'm a percussion player, I'm not a drummer, you know, like, a, <laughs> like it's like I don't touch these things, you know, but it sucks, but it's part of the game. You have to be able. And one instrument musical, even if you know the best, a guitar, a keyboard. Sometimes they will ask you, for example, on the show I was working with, I was playing all the time drum, but I have one song I have to, at the end of the song, I have to have a little keyboard and I have to do a pad. Like, that's for, for padding. It's, it's, you need to do. So it's, a, it's just something important. Or in one show, they make me, Michelle, they put me a uh, octopad. But I was playing it as a xylophone, kind of, that we put sound in, uh, in 
tax on in Alberta, and I was really playing a, a, like a, a song. So this is something you have to be open-minded for that. Um, and let's put after that as a practicing and routine. Uh, when you say, uh, like uh, if I go with the uh, shipping the day, then like you have to shape your day like as a musician on tour. That's mean you need to practice still, but you need to not burn yourself. If you normally, this big production will do one to three shows per day. So if you do three shows yeah. per day and you're like, I always do two hour rehearsing per day, uh, it won't happen. Sorry about that, but you will do six hour shows plus break plus all, you will be done. So you need to be able to uh, disconnect things. So for example, if you have one show per day, for me, my only time when I was in two shows, I was giving myself a 30 minutes before the sound check playing whatever I wanted, but don't burn in myself. And because if you do a show and it's it's very good, you go to eat and you do a second show, but you're tired, you have stomach problem, I don't know, you, you miss one TV program you like and you're sad, it will affect your playing, you know? <laughs> and, and, it, and it's the truth. Yes, yes. You know, there's people, they will be like, I, I didn't see that show. Uh, well, it's okay. But the people think we, we are human. So if you don't play, if you don't keep the focus where I want to go with that, you need to have a so good focus. It would be more important than how you play the music. The music will be okay. You're a good musician. If you, whatever person, if you practice, you will be a good musician. But yeah, I think it over the mission on top is way more focus, be professional, be on time, um, practice mm -hmm. well your things, like be, behave well, you know, like all these things will be way more important for me if, as a musical director than if you are the best drummer on earth, but you're not so cool to do it. So it's, it's, it's one thing for the other. So, but you can have both. But my point is like, if I have to pick it, I will pick the person is you do all the thing I just told you. Then the, if this one even can play like 200 beat on the double bass, one double stroke, whatever, you know, so I will pick the other guy, you know, because it will be, it will be nicer for me to work with. Yeah. At the end of the day, the, the human, the human factor is so important, you know, in, in, and interactivity and being able to to be part of the solution you know, always getting back to to that you know you're absolutely right and you know i mean we can we can talk about all of these things uh for weeks but i think um you know this might require a follow up one day in in uh, in what other country you might yep. be in at the time <laughs> but, we'll do but, we'll do yeah, no, no, this will be fun, and and you know, watching you because I I see <clears throat> I see some of your posts sometimes, and I see you know where where people are at, what they're doing, and it's so it's so nice to see people doing you know great things and inspirational things and and positive things. It's 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 so nice. I I laugh when I when I see somebody doing something really really great, and fun. You know, it doesn't have to be like they got the Not Grammy, all. but just just doing the just being there and being part of the positive, the, the thing that we can do. And that's, you know, part of the solution, yeah, always. Yeah, right? I would like to try to catch Co uh, Cosa one day. I, I, it never happened because I was on tour. And yeah. most of the time when you do, you, you are doing something, it's, uh, it's always when and my high peak of the show. So, but one day let's make it happen. Okay, yes. let's try to, to catch up. Could be cool. I would like to, but maybe Co uh, Cuba sounds super nice, but sometimes Vermont is or yeah. closer or, or, than the... Or Italy. All right, yeah, yeah, that's cool, but this is a, uh, what can be cool? <laughs> yeah. You know, once, uh, not twice, maybe. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and yeah. now, you know, I have, a, I have a place in Italy, so now I'm setting up to be uh, physically there half the time. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, now it's, it's a flying in and out and going places is it, so much easier than it used to be. And so I'm, I'm going back. I was there twice this year because I was uh, uh, there for the month of July last year setting up my my place on the it's 300 steps from the beach in calabria and it's wow. a beautiful place cool. and then uh, i was there in october because i was doing a concert in venice and then rome and so i i went just to finish up and see how what it felt like in october and you know i see that no this is perfect and and then seeing who's around what other people what what the environment could be so i i have the the, the idea for the next uh projects there for sure <laughs> i'll tell you about it yeah 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 sure sure but why you pick it Italy? like because you have family I'm, there well you have i was born in calabria 
you know. Are you born there, Kiki? Because I, I don't know if you, where you were born. Yes, how, yes, yes. Right. I was I was nine years old when we came. So and I've always traveled back and forth. I've always you know been kind of there. But then we decided, um, if you're going to be in a warm climate, where would it be? Well, you know, I speak four languages. I'm fluent in English, French, Italian, and Spanish. So that's not a problem. Um, but then I thought, you know, this this would be wonderful. And I visited a friend of mine said, you, I, we bought a place here. And I said, great, let's start a community here, an, an, art, an artistic community, and do a COSA event around all of this. And, and it's easy. There's a, an airport nearby within 45 minutes. So that's everything is, is, is there. But, you know, the world is our, is our plan, you know, is our village, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how many? Uh, for, you said, how many years do you have with Cosa right now? Like total well, since now, the beginning. Uh, we start. Well, it was would be twenty eight years now. Okay, it's a lot. Yes, we started in it's Vermont. Long, long, long. The big project in Vermont that was, I mean, huge. And then and then China, Cuba, Europe. You know, and we were just <clears> it was just growing. And then of co with COVID, of course, we had everything stopped. So now we're re. Re-engineering, restarting, rethinking, re—you know—thinking. Okay, what would be the next interesting step for from from where we are, and and you know the next generation to help them out, and and it's always interesting because you know you're always in your mind you're still the same age, <laughs> you know people forget yeah. that you're you yeah. to yourself you're still the same age whether you're 16 or 75 or you know doesn't matter you're still there so you're still thinking as long as you have a their health mental and physical that doesn't change anything so you're moving forward and and you know i for example when i was when i had uh, mark juliana on yep. this podcast i mean mark juliana was a student of ours for, he came to the cosa camps for two years as a as a participant when he was oh. 15 16 and and many many others like that who later are have their stories and and their inspiration they met other people other projects came from that and and that's the way life is you know it's it's um just coming to the table yeah. and meeting people networking being a good person being a, a you know a hard working musician being professional like like you say and you know being on time oh, yeah. and just all of those things and we learn and then we get a chance to work with all great people and we bring them together i mean the day you come you bring your ideas and to the table and inspire all those other people who you know they they need to hear it from from you from neil peart from uh, steve gad from whoever is at cosa you know because now we can bring to the table and this is how we live and if that means anything to you maybe it will inspire, and that's that's what I'm hoping. Like people inspired me. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, I think I, everybody. I mean, I, I, a million of people inspired me, not just musicians. You know, like uh, yeah. like whatever. So I mean, it's uh, I think it's important, and particularly when uh, I just did like uh, uh, last September, at the end of September, like a uh, not a master class, but like a a tutorial, like in person in uh, in Alma College. I was in my hometown for a week. And I called because I all, almost all the teachers are my my co student when I was studying there. Now they're teaching there. They are teacher there. So I and I showed up and I started to talk about businesses and I realized a lot of it's cool to see the eyes of the kids. They are like or like they're teenager. They're like a kid teenager, like sixteen to nineteen mostly. Mm -hmm. them like with like sparkling and stars and they really want to make it happen. And I like to see that. But at the same time, I told them, okay, perfect. But there's reality. You need to work hard too. You, have, you know, it's a, I mean, it, it's not just like a, a butter. You will jump on it and, you know, you, it's, and it's not just music. You need to sell yourself and work in art. And so I give them a lot of cues. And I, I like to do that because you see, um, not just, but me, I was one person, but the college hired like a few people for, for inspire them during the year. And, and you see they're really motivated. And I hope a lot of people, uh, can can be uh, can still feel that flame and continue to keep playing music until to be a better musician. Sure. You know? 
No, no, and that and that's great that you did that, and and I think it's important for all of us to to continue to do that as much as we can, not just from the musical, from the personal, but also from the business point of view, because after all, it is a a business, and business just means uh, being professional about it and doing all the yeah. professional things that are required, and you know, there's no such thing as if you stay home and nobody hears about you that you're going to your phone is going to ring i mean your phone is going to ring if you're if you're on time if you're a good person you play well you're dependable you know your stuff you've you're out there you've connected with people you know going to camps going to events yep. going to a- anything that you meet other people <clears throat> who are like minded and will it's understand good you, it's good you say that i don't want to cut you but you said something good say go to a camp go to school um i really encourage that because for example um if you okay i would put it this way if you have like let's say one thousand dollar in your in, in budget for spending something you already have a drum let's say you have a kit intermediate sounds great good head it's all good <laughs> i would really suggest if you to expect to spend this money in education and like camp like you do or like a school go to see a master um and maybe save a 10% of it for buying, you can buy a splash or like a, a gear, something as an example. But my, why I want to go with that is like, it's super easy now with Marketplace, uh, uh, Kijiji, uh, like uh, uh, Craigslist, all those websites, you see gear every day. If you have the money, go for it. If you work and you do like a, a lot of, like a, a lot of dough per month and you can afford that code. But if you're a student, I always say don't, like try to invest more in the education. You will have that money in the future to buy your dream drum. You know? And and every time I say the same, like so few, how many times I can more than ten times you don't bought a big huge kit for nothing, and we at the end they sell it and they end up with a I was an example like a Ludwig, twelve, uh, fourteen, sixteen, and uh, twenty-two bass drum, a snare, three three cymbals, and uh, that's it. Is what you need <laughs> at the end of the. Except if you do a tribute to a metal band or you have a, you need that, those accessories, it's okay. But I mean, if you're a normal player or a student or you play, you want to play all around, uh, even if you have 25 drums, it won't change anything. If you have the right snare, yeah. I was talking with Pierre Pilon, uh, a good friend of mine, a good drummer from Montreal. Yes. And Pierre told me, Eric, I did all with two Gretsch snare on my life. <laughs> so the, exactly. the, the, the two, he has two, three snare. I would say, but it's two Gretsch and one Ludwig. He did all with that. And, and whatever brand you great, you can have one pearl master. It's really cool. But my point is like you don't need if you don't. If you don't have the money, you don't, have the money, you don't need. So it will it won't stop education. They will meet other professional players. Then they would probably invite them to their house in another country. You know, it's a it's a sure. it's a plus 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 plus. So I, I, it's just a, a thing because I, it's so tentative. It, we, we, of course, we of really course, want to touch and have you here all the time. Oh, no, and, and we, but yeah, but no, it and, won't change, you know, like in this right. And we've all seen this. I mean, I, I had a student once who came in one day and he had a, this was maybe 15 years ago, he came in and he said, Aldo, I, I spent weeks looking for this. And he had a snare drum. At the time, it was like $1,500 or $2,000. And I looked at him and I said, okay, let's put it down. Let's do the lesson and let's talk about it after. Like he just didn't do anything. He just, and so I said to him, I don't think you can stay here and study with me anymore because you seem to be spending all your time in music shops. And so maybe that's what you should do. And he went, what? Yeah. I said, well, you're what? investing <laughs> so much time in the things that are not necessary. I don't even have a snare drum like that. And I would never buy a snare drum like that unless, you know, I had extra money or or, or, or even that. It's in your hands, your music. Not the, the, the drum helps, but it's not, that's not what's going to make you come, come here and make you play better. You're going backwards, I'm saying. <laughs> but you did spend a lot of time in the somewhere else. That's not, that's not a good investment. <laughs> that gives you no, oh, no dividends. None. Zero. In fact, and, uh, you know, that drum will not make you the player you want to be. This Damn. lesson would be if you practiced, <laughs> you know, or go study somewhere, do something, you know, like that. Yep. Invest in yourself. I said, you know, not, not in, in this now. Later, you, you have choices, but now you have to invest in yourself. And, the, and we always yep. invest. I mean, we're students for life anyway, but yep. that's important, right? 
it's important. Like, like uh, I remember, like for a long time, I, I was spending so much time in the uh, the library of my college, and I'm a big fan of Peter Riskin. So I was I destroyed the VHS cassette back in the <laughs> days. I really destroyed the cassette. I watched it so much. It was the old like a uh, he was looking like a bus driver, like, you know, like like you know that like, that look uh, yes, at that yes. age. But I like it so much. I, I just he was just doing like stuff, stuff, and I really dig it. But for one, I want to go with that. I uh, was uh, with uh, Don Lombardi, and he said, I, "You want DVD? We have a lot of Don DVD. I can give." So I said, "Just show." I picked one, and it was the one with uh, with him with Peter Eskin. So I come back to my school and I give it to them. I said, "Sorry, I destroyed your thing. <laughs> now I want people have the chance." Of course, you will tell me YouTube have an access, but it was more for the the fun fact and for the. But but I, they spent maybe at that time a cassette like that was maybe fifty bucks. Could, That's like, right. Terry Bozio, the the double VHS was one hundred fifty dollars, something like one hundred dollars. It was expensive. Yes. So so I give it back to them, but they spent on that, and I enjoyed more doing that and what and reading modern drum. I read so much modern drummer when I was a kid. Like uh, he told me, like you you have so much. He told me like. You know so much uh, about a lot of people, a lot of drama. I have a good memory, a, a, a very visual. So when I read, I, I kept, I read so much about drumming. Um, uh, um, and this is something I think is sad now because the people read less or they're, after five seconds, they turn pages. They don't spend time to read that. I think I was, no joking, I spent like some time reading 10 times the same article just to be sure I understand it well. Because I was a kid, you know, my first modern drummer, I think my dad gave it to me. I was nine or ten years old, wow. eight years old, you know. So, so, and I got, and it's, I gave it then to a friend of mine. I have, like, I was a membership until maybe 2018, 19, because now I, I was on the route, I could, I on the way, I couldn't get them. I, I had like 100 and 100 of my giving. So I, I put an ad, so I give it for free. I kept a few and I give the to a friend to say i'm gonna read i asked him the other day do you are still reading it yeah i'm still reading hey, so not, it's impossible sure. to finish that it's an incredible good library yeah um, no, no absolutely yeah and, and it's important to you know invest in oneself education i mean we're students for life and the you know what i was going to say is i mean we can talk forever but i really want to thank you for for joining me today eric and and we'll we'll oh, have the opportunity to to follow this up at some point and catch catch up again <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, for sure. but and and as i always say to be continued